Hello and welcome to Beverly Baptist Church. My name is Naomi and I'm going to be leading this service today. Later on, Phil's going to come and speak to us about Moses, but first Emily's going to lead us as we sing. Let's join together in praise and worship. We join together as people of hope. Hope not in ourselves, but in Jesus Christ, our Saviour, our living hope. So let's sing together.
Thanks guys. Now due to the current lockdown, there's not much in terms of notices today, just a few reminders. The Crunchy Fairies continue to deliver special deliveries to celebrate birthdays, anniversaries and other special occasions. Please get in touch with Karen in the church office if you have anything to celebrate so she can get a message to the Chief Fairy. If you're watching this on Sunday morning, don't forget to join us on Zoom for virtual coffee at 11.30. You should have received the, an email with the link. I look forward to seeing you there. And finally, if you or anyone in your family are ill, isolating, or just finding things hard, please get in touch with someone from the leadership team or the church office so that we can support you in whatever ways you need. One of the ways that we can support each other is in prayer. Romans 12, 10 to 13 says, be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Now, as we pray for our church community, you might want to grab your church contact list and have a look at the names as we pray. Otherwise, our guide is to think about different groups of people that we know, whether in the Beverly Baptist Church community or in your wider contacts. Lord, we pray for our church community. We pray for those who live by themselves and are feeling isolated. Be with them and comfort them. We pray for children and young people at school, college and university, whether learning in person or at home. Encourage and strengthen them. We pray for teachers and other education staff. Fill them with energy and patience as they deal with the ever-changing circumstances. We also pray for parents who might be finding homeschooling hard. We pray for those members of our congregation who are healthcare workers. Protect them and let them be a source of light and strength to those they come in contact with. We pray for those who are suffering with ill health. Heal and restore them. We pray for those who are working in difficult circumstances, whether that be at home or in the workplace. We pray for those for whom work is currently uncertain and challenging. We pray for the leadership team and others in positions of responsibility. Give them wisdom and grace. Lord, guide us to support each other and help those in need at this difficult time. Amen. In a few minutes, Phil is going to be sharing from the Bible about Moses' journey following God to new places. When God called Moses through the burning bush, God said, Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. When we come into the presence of Almighty God, we are standing on holy ground. This is not something to be undertaken lightly. We are coming into the presence of the all-powerful and holy Creator God. And it's right that we examine ourselves and ask for his forgiveness, as his perfection highlights our failings. And yet, as we're told in the New Testament, in the letter to the Hebrews, through Jesus we have assurance of forgiveness and therefore we can approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Confidence in God's love and mercy, not in our own worthiness. So let's spend some time now uh, in response to that, preparing ourselves to meet with God, remembering that we stand on holy ground but that we are invited here by our God who loves us. Let's start by singing, by grace alone, somehow I stand. By grace 
let's be still in God's presence and as we just play through the music now let's use this time for quiet prayer and reflection as we enjoy being in God's presence together.
Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law. Moses said to him, Let me go back to my people in Egypt. I want to see if they are still alive. Jethro said to Moses, You may go. Have a safe trip. While Moses was still in Midian, the Lord said to him, Go back to Egypt. The men who wanted to kill you are dead now. So Moses took his wife and his sons and put them on a donkey. Then he started back to Egypt. He took with him the walking stick of God. The Lord said to Moses, When you get back to Egypt, do all the miracles. I have given you the power to do them. Show them to the king of Egypt, but I will make the king very stubborn. He will not let the people go. Then say to the king, This is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you to let my son go. Let him go so he may worship me, but you refuse to go to let Israel go, so I will kill your firstborn son. As Moses went, was on his way to Egypt, he stopped at a resting place for the, Lord, for the night. The Lord met him there and tried to kill him, but Zipporah took a flint knife and circumcised her son. She took the skin and touched Moses' feet with it. Then she said to him, You are a bridegroom of, my, of blood to me. Zipporah said this because she had to circumcise her son so the Lord did not kill Moses. Meanwhile, the Lord said to Aaron, Go out to the desert to meet Moses. When Aaron went, he met Moses at Sinai, the mountain of God, and kissed him. Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had said to him when he sent him to Egypt, and Moses told him about the miracles which the Lord had commanded him to do. So Moses and Aaron gathered all the elders of the Israelites. Aaron told them everything that the Lord had told Moses. The Moses the, then Moses did the miracles for all the people to see, so the Israelites believed. They heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their troubles. Then they bowed down and worshipped him. After Moses and Aaron talked to the people, they went to the king of Egypt. They said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so they may hold a feast for me in the desert. Last week we saw how Abraham was told to go to the promised land and there become a great people. Moses' commission is the other way round. Go and get the great people and bring them to the promised land. We've jumped forward 500 years. God's prophecy to Abraham has begun to be fulfilled. He's had a son, Isaac, who had twin sons, Jacob and Esau, and Jacob had 12 sons. And they settled in the land to which God had called Abraham, until a famine comes and through a series of events, primarily involving Joseph, one of Jacob's sons, the whole family go down to Egypt as guests of the Pharaoh. At that point there are some 70 or 75 people. Not quite the great nation which God had promised to Abraham, but the beginnings of that. And we read at the beginning of the book of Exodus how they become increasingly numerous while they're living in Egypt. Sadly, as inevitably happens due to human nature, the growing minority comes to be seen as a threat by the dominant party and is oppressed. The Hebrew people are forced into slavery but the more they are oppressed, the more they grow, becoming a great people, as God has promised, a nation within a nation. And so Pharaoh, a new Pharaoh, not the one who'd first invited them down to Egypt, there's been a few hundred years by this point, Pharaoh orders all the Hebrew boys to be drowned at birth. It's been used by many over the years as an effective way of wiping out an ethnic group. Wipe out the men. The women left are forced to marry Egyptians, if they're married at all, and so any children born would be considered Egyptian, and in that way the Hebrew bloodline and culture can be eradicated. Many of you will know the story. Moses' mother hides him in a basket in the river. He's found by Pharaoh's daughter, who takes him as her son, and so he grows up in the palace. But he never forgets his Hebrew heritage and one day he jumps to the defence of one of his own people who's being ill-treated and in the process he kills an Egyptian. He's forced to flee for his life. He runs across the Sinai Peninsula to Midian in modern-day Saudi Arabia. And there he finds a wife, 
starts a family and settles down to life as a shepherd. And that could be the end of the story of Moses. Except God hasn't forgotten the people of Abraham and his promise to bless them. And the promise that he made to Abraham that those who bless him and his family will be blessed and those who curse them will be cursed. And so he will not leave the people to be oppressed and downtrodden by the Egyptians. He plans to deliver them. And Moses is a key part of his plan to do so. And so we come to another well-known story. Moses, the shepherd, out with the sheep in the wilderness, comes to the mountain Horeb, or Sinai. And there God appears to him in a bush, which is on fire but does not burn. And God brings him a message. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And there follows a long back and forth conversation with Moses trying to come up with reasons why he shouldn't do it and God giving him a number of miraculous signs to confirm that this is a genuine call and God will be with him. Eventually, in response to Moses' claim that he is slow of speech and tongue, God says that Moses' elder brother, Aaron, can join him in this mission to do the talking. And so we come to the end of God's conversation with Moses and to our reading today. So let's look at these verses and see what we can learn about how God is calling and the people respond. The first thing I think we notice is that God calls people to work together. These verses that we read earlier actually contain two instances of God calling people to go. The first is Moses, verse 19. The Lord had said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt. God calls him to return to Egypt. It's now some 40 years since he fled with a price on his head for murder. Those who were looking to enact that sentence have passed on. A new Pharaoh is ruling. Moses is safe to go back. And it's also now the right time for the role that God has for him. And God calls and Moses, like Abraham last week, obeys that call. He takes his wife and his sons and he sets off for Egypt. But there's also a call to Aaron, Moses' older brother who still lives with the rest of the family in Egypt. And God calls him too, we're not told how. But he's told to go into the wilderness to meet Moses. Possibly quite a surprising message. We've, we've got no way of knowing whether the family even knew that Moses was still alive. Uh, had they heard anything from him during his time in exile? But Aaron too obeys the voice of God, heads off into the wilderness guided by God and meets Moses. And so the two brothers become a team. They have gifts and skills which complement each other. Moses feels he's unable to speak well. Aaron, on the other hand, is eloquent. And so having heard from Moses everything that God had told him, it is Aaron who passes that message on to the leaders of the Israelites. And in fact, Aaron is an essential part of the team at this point. If Moses had wandered out of the desert, a wandering shepherd from Midian, known by nobody, appearing alone, why would they listen to him? Even if he explains to them who he is, that won't help. Well, who is he? He's a man brought up in Pharaoh's palace. Well, that kind of makes him a bit suspect already. He fled the country because he murdered someone. 
Ooh, and now 40 years later, he's turned up out of nowhere with some idea that he's heard the voice of God. Not exactly a great CV to get people to listen. Aaron is needed. He's quite possibly one of the elders of the Israelites himself. He's 83 years old by this point. But at the very least, he can provide a way into that group. He can give Moses a voice among the people. And those elders and the people they represent are actually an important third party as God is calling people to work together. Because Moses and Aaron can only succeed in their mission if they have the backing of the people. There's no point in them going to Pharaoh to negotiate the freedom of the Hebrew people if the Hebrew people then won't trust them and follow. In fact, one of the unanswered questions of Moses' story is how Moses and Aaron got an audience with Pharaoh. It's unlikely that just any Hebrew slave would be admitted to his presence. It's possible, I suppose, that Moses could still pull some strings within the palace. But it's more likely that they are received as the nominated representatives of the Hebrew people. They need the status that is given to them by the Hebrew elders in order to fulfil their mission. They have to be part of the team. And it's the same for us today. God rarely calls people to live, live the Christian life in isolation. Actually, he probably never calls people to live it in complete isolation. Even the missionary called to go alone deep into the jungle to make contact with a new tribe needs the wisdom, the advice, the experience of others, not to mention an army of prayer support. But in most cases, the team is even more obvious. No one person has everything necessary for any mission of God. Even those called to lead up projects or to specific roles need always to be seeking those who can help them. All of us, in whatever we think God might want us to do, need to be aware of the gaps in our gifting. Moses was very aware and yes, there may have been an element of him pulling his lack of confidence as a public speaker as an excuse to get out of something he doesn't want to do. But God doesn't let him. He provides someone to help with those areas where Moses is weak. We too need to make sure that we're not using the fact that we don't completely fit a role as an excuse to get out of doing it. But rather than looking for those who God might send to help us to fit that role better. But there's also the opposite danger of being so sure that God is calling us that we paper over the gaps in our gifts. We believe we can do it all alone and we're not willing to seek the team that we need around us. And that way things can so easily go wrong. It's not always just about gifts either. Sometimes it's just people's previous experience, who they know, the contacts they have. As Aaron was able to provide a doorway for Moses into the gathering of the elders of the Israelites. So God graciously often calls the right people to be there to accompany us on each stage of the journey, bringing the gifts and the experience. And we need to be willing to be looking out for who God has placed in our path for such a time as this. I'm sure many of us can think of examples from our personal life of people who have been just the right person to be there with you at a particular time. But it can happen for churches too. Just to give one example, uh, the church I grew up in was a small fellowship. The building was about 100 years old. It was in pretty good condition. But things don't last forever. And at one point, the old oil-fired boiler, which had been a little bit temperamental for a while, eventually gave up. There was a man who had worshipped at that church who'd left a few years before for another church but had come back to us about a year before the boiler failed. And he just happened to be a retired heating engineer who was able to source us a new gas-fired commercial boiler at cost and fit it free of charge. Not long after, he left the fellowship again. But he had been there just the right time when his experience and skills were needed. The second thing we see from this passage, God's call is to release 
the oppressed. What is God building this team to do? The details of that will vary from situation to situation, but the underlying principle is incredibly consistent throughout Scripture. For Moses, Aaron and the Israelites, the message to Pharaoh was simple. Let my people go. They're being sent because the Lord was concerned about the Israelites and had seen their misery. Chapter 4 verse 31 tells us. They had a specific mission, a particular message relating to that people in that time. But there's a sense in which the message of God's people is always the same. Let my people go. The story of the Exodus, as we read on, we find it's, it's fundamental to the identity of God's people in the Old Testament. And it finds echoes on into the New Testament also. A message about freedom, liberation, release from oppression, which is at the heart of the gospel, the good news. That could be slaves being freed from captivity, as in Exodus, or still in places around the world today. It could be a relatively powerless minority being consistently overlooked or downtrodden by a more powerful group, whether that's black people being treated as somehow less human than white or, or women as less valuable than men. It could be the people that Jesus freed from captivity to physical illness or those who are released from the control of addictions. All of these are part of the gospel message because they're all symptoms of the fundamental underlying captivity from which we all need deliverance. The captivity to sin. The effects of which are felt in so many ways. The breakdown of society and community. Anger, rage and war rather than peace and harmony and love. The destruction of our planet. All of these have at their heart, at their root cause, the brokenness of humanity. That we are held captive by our own sinful natures, so that we are all powerless at times to choose what is good and right, what is God's will. We find ourselves falling once again into selfish greed, arrogant justification of our wrong actions, ignorance of God and his ways. This is the greatest captive of all, from which the message of the Bible is the same. Let my people go. A message which reaches its fullest expression in the person of Jesus, dying on the cross, submitting himself to death, but then rising in triumph from the grave three days later. The ultimate let me go. As even death cannot hold him. And so the people of God, both those who lived before, like Abraham and Moses, and we who come after, can know that as we have faith in God's delivering power, we cannot be held by sin and evil and death. The empty tomb on Easter morning declares most emphatically, not just let my people go, but my people have been let go. I have delivered them, says God. I have rescued them. Moses leading the people out of slavery in Egypt is a foretaste. It's a picture of that greater leading out of slavery. As the one who was promised, the descendant of Abraham, Jesus, brings us out of slavery. The whole creation is liberated from its bondage and brought into the full freedom of life in him. This is the message which he has entrusted to us. The message which we have to bring to the world. The reason that he calls us to work together as his church. That the world might see and know that deliverance for themselves. One final thing we can learn from this passage. God is with us. We do not do this alone. Moses and Aaron were not alone. They knew that God had called them to this task, but he'd not just called them and left them to get on with it. As they appear before the elders of the Israelites, God enables them to perform a number of miraculous signs to prove the divine call. So that the people believe them, and more importantly, believe that the Lord is there. He has seen their plight. 
He is concerned about them. And that leads them to bow in worship. Those same signs are performed in front of Pharaoh too, a witness to him of the power of God with them, that this is not just a human mission. Pharaoh's response, of course, is different. He doesn't believe and worship. He hardens his heart against the Lord and against their message. But still those signs provide proof to those who are willing to believe that the Lord is with Moses and Aaron. The spectacular, the miraculous occurs in scripture as proof of God's presence, as endorsement of individuals and their mission, most notably of course in Jesus. As the power of God flowing through him heals so many and proves his special status as the one called by God. But even where there aren't miracles, the pages of the Bible are filled with stories of those who experience that God is with them, who know that they are not alone as they seek to live out the life to which he has called them. Much of what we've seen today has application for each of us as individuals and for anybody watching this video wherever you are in the world. But as we draw to a close, just three things more specifically for Beverly Baptist Church as we apply these principles in our situation. Firstly, as we look to the future of this fellowship and new avenues are opening up, we are already seeing God bringing new people to join us with valuable gifts and experience which may prove to be just what we need at this time. So God is building his team. And we are a team. This church was founded on that principle. And it's perhaps never been as important as it is at this time. Our existing patterns are changing. Some of us may find the roles that we've taken up before are now no longer necessary. But there are new opportunities opening up. We work together, valuing each other's contributions, seeking the right people with the right gifts for each role. Knowing that everyone has some part to play in this mission. Also recognising that none of us is called to go alone in this. Secondly, let us remain clear on our mission. We are called to a message of liberation, of setting people free. And that is a multifaceted message. There are practical implications. The steering group for the Armstrongs project met this week and one thing we reaffirmed is our desire that in any building works that we do, we ensure that we at least meet and preferably exceed what is necessary in terms of disability access legislation. So that we can ensure that for us as a church and for those who come in to use the building, we are actively seeking to free them from anything that might constrain their ability to use those facilities. And also in terms of what we do from that building, someone used the phrase recently about it being a place of healing. And our society, our world need healing at this time. There is so much fear, so many people feeling trapped by coronavirus, by lockdown, trapped physically in their houses, trapped mentally in their heads. We have a key role to play in enabling people to become free again. To be able to meet with others in a place where they feel safe and welcome. To build relationships. To rest and restore their physical and mental well-being. But most importantly, it must be a place that makes known in word and in deed, in worship and in action, the freedom that is offered to all in Jesus. Liberation from sin and death and hell. The wonderful freedom 
to live the fullness of life with him for time and for eternity. And thirdly, we know that God is with us in this. We may feel we don't see the miraculous often, though I think we can definitely point to events that can be nothing other than God's intervention in answer to prayer. But we can know that same sense of his presence. Indeed, I dare to say that as we live out this mission of liberation together, we will know his presence affirming who we are and what we are called to do, empowering us to do things we didn't think we would ever be able to achieve, enabling us to speak his liberating freedom into our world. So let us go in the power of the Spirit and declare to the world, in Jesus Christ, God's people have been set free. And let us live in that freedom, which he offers to us all by grace, through faith. Amen. Thanks, Phil. We're coming to the end of our service now, but before we sing our last song, I'd like to thank Phil for his sermon, Emily for leading the music, and Chris for putting it all together so beautifully. We're going to close by singing, By Faith We See the Hand of God, which was recorded last summer. We're going to close our service by singing together, By Faith We See the Hand of God. And the chorus says, We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. Let's sing together. <laughs>